One week later, and the pain from the fight had been replaced by the pain in Florent's backside. It had been a long time since he'd ridden a horse, but even then, it had been with the aid of a decent, well-tanned saddle. Compared to the supple leather work he was used to, this one felt as though it had been carved out of a block of wood. But even if he'd been a trained cavalryman, riding along with the best saddle in the world, the pace that Domno Sherve set would have been grueling. It started every day in the first grey light of dawn. Before the sun had even risen, the Strigany women and the merchant servants would crawl reluctantly out of their wagons, coughing and grumbling loud enough to drown out the bird song. Huddled in ragged blankets, they'd stumble about the camp, drawing water or shivering as they blew life back into their cooking fires. Meanwhile, while the acrid smell of wood smoke mingled with that of the honeyed porridge in the cold dawn air, the men would harness their oxen back to their wagons, whispering to them with a tenderness that their families could only dream of. And then, with the sun still little more than a rumor beyond the black silhouette of the mountains beyond, the day's journey would begin. The beat of the march was slow, but it was constant. The remorseless tread of the oxen stopped for nothing but a black thread that Domno Sherves kept wound around his wrist. When the sky was so dark that this thread could no longer be seen against it, the caravan would stop. Then, and only then. And yet, the trail oxen that pulled the wagons seemed perfectly content to grind along for hour after hour, day after day. Not only that, but so did the caravan's outriders. There were maybe a dozen of them, two-man patrols that flitted around the caravan like bees around a hive. It was only a matter of time before Flora and Lorenzo, both well-armed and mounted, were asked to join them. How about it? The Domno had asked them one night as they sat around the campfire. We're coming up to the foothills now, which is where things start to get interesting. Of course, Flora had replied. We'd be glad to. And in fact, he had been glad to. Although picking his way through the wilderness was harder than just plodding along with the caravan, it was also a lot more enjoyable. Even Lorenzo stopped grumbling, the better to study the land. Although empty of human life, the rolling countryside was rich and bountiful. Fields of wild corn gave way to lush green meadows, glades of autumn-ripened pear trees, their leaves alive with the buzz of insects, lay unguarded. Their fruit was left to rot where it fell, or was picked through by flocks of stringy-looking hens. Occasionally they would come across the remains of abandoned villages. The stubborn angles of their walls remained standing and despite the wisteria that softened their edges, defiant. There was no telling how long the derelict buildings had stood thus. Maybe decades, maybe centuries. Either way, the two friends hurried through them. Accidental shrines to a population long since washed away by bloody tides of war or plague, they seemed best left undisturbed. And all the while, the mountains loomed larger in the east. Despite the clear skies and bright sunlight, they remained black, as though permanently overcast by a shadow of their own making. Only the highest crests were shining, white tips of ice scattered among the hazy clouds. As the weeks passed, the mountains drew nearer. The ravines that splintered their craggy hides could be seen with the naked eye, as deep as the wrinkles of a crone's frown. Florent, frowning himself from saddle soreness and sunburn, was staring at them when they came across the ambush. It was their horses that saved them. They'd been trotting along a shaded deer path, the passing tree trunks rippling the sunlight into zebra patterns on their coats when they reared up in a sudden stop. There seemed neither warning nor reason for the halt, and it came so unexpectedly that Florent was flung over the mare's neck. He landed on his shoulder and rolled, cursing to himself as he tumbled through the undergrowth. The thorns were scratching, but at least they broke his fall, and one moment later he was scrambling back to his feet. He turned to see that Lorenzo had seized the horse's bridle, catching her before she bolted. She smelled something, the older man said, keeping his voice calm as the horse shifted around him. Flora saw that he was right. Nelly's ears were laid back, her eyes white and rolling, her nostrils quivering as she sniffed at the breeze. He could almost see the fear rising in her. Could it be wolves? Flora suggested. 
matching Lorenzo's gentle tones as he went back to stroke her. Nelly whinnied then turned her muzzle into his hand. Uh, maybe. The wind is coming from over that ridge, Florent said, gesturing towards a rocky outcrop that cut across the path ahead. Tell you what, you hold on to Nelly here and I'll go have a look. Lorenzo sucked his front tooth and looked doubtful. Maybe we should both go. It could be wolves. Then again, it could be anything. It could be a dragon. A dragon, Florent scoffed uneasily, his voice lowering to a whisper. Who knows, Lorenzo shrugged. Might as well say dragon as wolf. Why do you think all the villages thereabouts are empty? Do you think a few mangy wolves would scare farmers away from good land? Flora frowned and looked again at the ridge. It looked a little like a dragon itself, a long, low shape that stretched in the forest. Then he sighed and turned back to Lorenzo. Probably not, but what can we do? We're supposed to be on patrol. We can't just go back because one of the horses jumped. No, I'm gonna look. Just hold the horses ready. I want to sneak up on whatever they smelled. What if it sneaks up on you first? Then we're gonna see if this still works, Flora winked and drew the pistol. He'd bought it in Bordelot before setting out. It was expensive, ornately decorated, and very heavy. It was also incredibly inaccurate. Despite hours of practice, Flora couldn't hit anything further away than 20 feet, unless the target happened to be a barn door. But even though he'd known of these disadvantages when he bought it, the lure of black powder weapons had been just too much. Besides, he thought, as he checked the firing pan and pulled back the wheel lock, it's powerful. The bullets could punch through steel plate as easily as if they were rusty tin. At least, they could if they hit it. Returning the gun to the holster, he padded quietly off through the leafy ground, his eyes already searching for handholds on the stone outcrop. It would not be a difficult climb, he could see that much. The surfaces were sloping and uneven, almost stepped, and creepers as thick as his wrist trailed along like a tangle of ropes. Slowing his pace, Flora began to slide his feet through the detritus of the forest floor, pushing it gently out of the way before stepping down so as to avoid crunching fallen twigs. Not that he believed in Lorenzo's dragon, he told himself, as he slowed his breathing. Not at all. He was only being cautious. By the time he reached the outcrop, his passage in the forest had become almost perfectly silent. The stone was hot beneath his fingers, sunbaked despite the sweet-scented breeze that blew across it. Florac rolled up it, pulling himself up from ledge to ledge, his palms sticky as a chameleon's as he worked his way towards the top, damp with warmth and the effort of moving quietly. The breeze whispered in the trees behind him, the sound as soothing as the stone was warm. As Flora climbed up to the last ledge, he wondered if they should rest here. They could eat the frugal bread and water meal the Domno had provided them with, while arguing about imaginary dragons. Then he crested the top of the outcrop, and suddenly he was no longer thinking about bread and water. He was thinking of pork. The sleeping herd below were surely wild boar, he decided. They certainly smelled wild enough. It was no wonder that the horses had stopped. This close even Florent's nose wrinkled at the musk rising up from their snoring bodies. Cautiously flattening himself against the rock, he licked his lips and gazed down upon the animals. Their fur, the color of rusty bristles on a wire brush, was coarse and ungroomed, and their tusks were jagged. Still, there was no reason to believe that the flesh was inedible. Flora, visions of pork chops sizzling in his imagination, counted 23 of the slumbering animals. As he did so, he thought back to the last time he'd seen their like. That had been on the other side of the world, and in much less happy circumstances. Then, he had been the hunted, not the hunter. Shuddering at that memory, he drew the pistol and, biting his lip with the effort of maintaining silence, he slowly readied it. The single mechanical click of the wheel lock was lost beneath the grunting and snoring of the herd. Flora inched the hexagonal barrel forward, resting it along one arm as he wondered which one to take. A young one, he thought, but not too young. We want meat which is tender, but we still want quite a lot of it. 
It really was a shame that he only had one shot. If he shot the grizzled old tusker that was lying nearest to him, sprawled out as if already dead, the younger ones would run. But if he shot one of them, would they provide enough meat? Torn between one target and the next, he hesitated. And in this moment of hesitation, the owner of the boars appeared. They loped into the clearing with a clumsy grace, rolling along like sailors on a pitching deck. The gates set their shoulders rising and falling, and their trailing knuckles swung back and forth like drummer's fists. Although mantle, they were heavier than humans. Their blunt heads were misshapen with mastiff jaws, and their mottled green hides bulged with a deformed strength. Some of the rags the creatures had stretched between their scraps of armor may well have been made for humans. Indeed, one of them was even wearing what could have been the jacket of an imperial officer, the fine gold braid just as scrubby as the strings of a mop. But there was no mistaking these vile creatures for anything other than what they were. Not even for a moment. Even Florent, who'd never seen a live one before, knew orcs when he saw them. He pressed his racing heart closer to the rock as more of them bundled into the clearing, and unhooked his finger from the trigger. Suddenly firing seemed like a bad idea. In fact, perched above a clearing full of such monsters, even his breath seemed too loud. The orcs, though, were too intent on their business to hear him, or even look up. As they dispersed among the herd, each seeking its own animal, the boars began to wake, and their mood, upon being woken up, was not sweet. They squealed and they snarled, they slashed their tusks at the legs of the orcs and at each other. One, a cunning old boar with a face that reminded Florao of Lorenzo, kept its eyes closed in faint sleep, snoring away as the orcs approached. It waited for one of the smaller orcs to wander within reach, and then, when he was no more than a foot away, it struck. The blunt daggers of its teeth tore a piece of flesh out of the rider's leg, a fist-sized chunk of green meat followed by a gout of dark blood. The orc howled with pain and staggered away, dancing about to the laughter of his companions. The boar chewed contentedly as the victim stumbled away, its blood darkening the ground. But one moment later, the wounded orc recovered, Flora winced as he watched it grind a handful of dirt into the wound, carelessly staunching the bleeding before resuming the search for its boar. By now, most of the orcs had found their mounts. Whatever savage bargain the beast had struck among themselves, it was obviously an individualistic one. It also seemed to be strangely democratic. The boars allowed their chosen riders to roll up onto their massive shoulders because it was their will, not because they were cowed or broken in. Flora, the sweat dampening the stone, watched the chaos below gradually resolve itself. Once they were mounted, the orcs, each one armed with a thick stabbing spear, milled about restlessly. Flora was seized by a terrible suspicion that they were going to round the outcrop upon which he was hiding and head towards Lorenzo and the horses. But even as he wondered whether or not to make a run for it, the leader, its skin as dark as ivy beneath its rusty plate mail, bellowed a command. Before it had time to finish the call, its mount decided to leave. With an impatient grunt, the boar turned and trotted off towards the north. The mob followed, a ragged stampede crashing in the undergrowth in a graceless avalanche of snarling boar and cursing orc. Flora stayed frozen as the noise of their progress faded. When it was no louder than the frightened chatter of the swallows that wheeled overhead, he turned and slithered back down to the forest floor. What was it? Lorenzo asked as he hastened back to the horses. Trouble, Flora said, wiping his palms before swinging up into the saddle. Orcs, dozens of them. Orcs, I thought so. Ignoring Florence's raised eyebrow, he turned and started to canter his horse back towards the caravan. Crom had no illusions about the men he was with. After just a couple of months in their lands, the ogre had no illusions about men at all. They were all weak, and most of them were cowards. He'd been shocked to see that even the most powerful among them, Mordisio, allowed a mere female to disrespect him. And the fragility of their bones. Well, it would shame even a noblar. The bruises that had covered Flora after his pathetically bloodless fight with the Strigony had lasted more than a week. Still, despite this healthy contempt, 
Crom wasn't fool enough to underestimate his traveling companions to the extent that they underestimated him. Humans, he knew, were intelligent. It was a strange, overly complicated kind of intelligence, and was just as likely to tangle up their planning as to facilitate it. But it was to be respected just the same. Take Domnus Sherves, Crom thought, turning back on the ox he was riding to study the strigony. He was weaker than most with age, but he had more power in his head than many ogres did in their fists. He seemed oddly immune to the human disease of fear, too. When he heard about the orcs that were gathering in the hills ahead, he just smiled. Crom's face became blank with thoughtfulness as he remembered the scene. It had been evening when Flora and Lorenzo, their faces flushed and their horses winded, had brought news of the orcs. Within minutes, the entire caravan had gathered around them, the merchants fluttering about like a gaggle of frightened geese. Sherves had waited for the fluttering to die down. And then, as confidently as if they were discussing something that already happened, he told them exactly how they were going to deal with the orcs. It was a good plan too, Crom reflected. So good that he'd seen no reason to open his mouth, especially when every other traveler on the caravan was doing exactly that. Now, as morning drifted into afternoon, the ogre could see the place the Domno had mentioned in his plan. It lay no more than half a mile ahead, a gap where the hills closed in on the trail like the post of a cemetery gate. Oak trees, their foliage as thick as the hairs on an ox's back, covered the slopes of the hills, hiding the ambushers who waited there. The leaves couldn't disguise their smell, though. To Crom's flattened nose, it was as sharp as an outhouse in high summer. He knew it for what it was. It was indeed orcs, full-grown orcs, and a lot of them. Some sort of animals seemed to be waiting with them, but he couldn't quite decide what they were. Goats, maybe. The sun sailed over the caravan towards the safety of the west, lengthening the shadows of the fifteen wagons and the two horsemen who were following the ogre. The hills closed in towards them, as slow and eager as a pack of wolves surrounding a flock of sheep. The smell of the orcs became stronger. Krom could already see where Sherves had guessed the attack would come. Up ahead, the trail wound through a meadow that was barely an acre across. On either side, the forested hills loomed as close as they could, the shadows they cast darkening the clearing. As the caravan rolled into the clearing, Crom turned again to see that the wagons were keeping up and keeping close. He knew that it was their fear, not their bravery, which kept the men following him into the trap. They knew they'd be safer facing the orcs this way than trying to outrun them. Even so, Crom expected half of them to panic and flee. Humans, he thought contemptuously, and lifted one leg to break wind. One moment later, as though in answer to the obscene gesture, a harsh, discordant horn sounded out of the woods to the right. Crom stopped and squinted towards the tree line. Although the horn still rang out, the sound of it was lost in a sudden commotion. The noise of splinting branches, the rumbling hooves, angry porcine squeals and fleeing deer. But what it was mostly composed of was a terrifying chorus of inhuman war cries. The noise of the boar rider's charge grew even louder as they crashed into the meadow. A terrible joy entered the orcs' voices as they caught sight of the caravan. It twisted their mouths into snarls of glee, and the yellow slashes of their eyes narrowed with an unholy excitement. Crom noted how the front runners of the ragged charge leaned forward, lantern jaws hanging between the flapping sails of their mount's ears as they closed in. The same bloodthirsty eagerness set them to swinging their short spears about in wild arcs, as if the weapons themselves were eager for battle. Some of the spear tips had already been bloodied, wet from accidental blows the riders had struck among their comrades. Two of them were locked in combat after one such incident, the caravan forgotten as they tried to strangle each other beneath their boar's disgusted gazes. But, for the most part, the charge continued despite these distractions the weapons continuing to swirl. Crom swung to the ground, hefted the axe, and spared a single look down the line of wagons. The snapshot glance was filled with the blur of crossbow bolts and the sudden gleam of unsheathed steel. Contented, Crom turned his attention back to the task at hand. 
and the task in hand was now. Despite their ungainly appearance, and despite the weight they were carrying, the boars had crossed the meadow with frightening speed. Barely a minute had passed since their horn had sounded, yet already Krom found the anticipation of combat becoming reality. With a bone-shaking roar, he threw himself forward to embrace it. If the nearest orc was surprised at this response, it gave no sign. Instead, it lowered its spear towards Krom's belly, the tip of the weapon weaving back and forth as it hurled itself at the ogre. Krom waited, holding himself in perfect stillness, until the steel was a second away from spitting him. Only then did he move, spinning his bulk to one side and seizing the spear in one fist. The boar continued the charge, snarling as it barreled through the space where the ogre had been. The rider, however, instinctively refusing to let go of the weapon, was hoisted from its back and thrown up into the air. Its war cry became a howl of surprise as it rocketed upwards, legs windmilling. Krom waited for it to begin to fall before he struck, swinging the axe in a one-handed blow that sent the falling orc's arm and head tumbling into the grass. The ogre grunted with satisfaction and a job well done. Then he slapped his free hand onto the haft of the axe and turned towards the enraged squeal of the victim's boar. There was no subtlety in the animal's attack, no strategy at all. It just barreled forward, tusks jutting up from the battering ram of its lowered head as it thundered at the ogre. Again, Krom made himself wait. Time stretched around him, a single second trickling past as slowly as a minute. At the end of it, the boar was close enough to taste the cloth of the ogre's breeches. It bit down hungrily, but even as the muscles of its jaws were bunching, Krom was moving, swinging away and cutting down in a single, liquid movement. The axe blade rose and fell as easily as if it had been wielded by a servant splitting wood. As easily and as successfully. With a deep crunch, the razor edge bit in the fur and skin, the muscle and bone. Then it cleaved into the boar's skull, splitting its brain as neatly as a ripe apple. The animal's squeal faded into a death rattle. Krom, with a wary glance around him, struggled to free the blade from the animal's carcass. But no matter which way he pulled, it was stuck, trapped in the solid bone of the boar's skull. Even in death, it seemed, the foul-tempered creature was too stubborn to relent. Krom felt a flicker of admiration for it as he abandoned his weapon and picked up the orc spear instead. With a lick of his lips, he searched for the next opponent, sniffing as eagerly as a hunting dog on the scent of its quarry. And there was plenty of quarry here, Krom fought contentedly, turning to select one. Most of them had made straight for the wagon train and were circling around the wagons, whooping with the joy of battle as the blood flowed. Initially, the high wooden sides of their carts had provided the travelers with some protection from the charge. Even now, most of the men remained perched on top of them, slashing down at the cavorting greenskins. Not all the wagons remained, though. A couple of them, their oxen maddened with fear, had broken from the line and were now being dragged towards the opposite patch of forest, orcs in pursuit. Another had been overturned. One of the barrels of wine it had carried had smashed open to bleed into the dust of the track. A boar was wallowing in the liquor, drinking greedily as the rider kicked at it and cursed. Krom was about to go in on that particular orc and put it out of its misery, when, with a flash of movement, Domnus Sherves leapt into his line of sight. The Strigany hurled an empty crossbow at one of the attackers, and then rushed forward to slash a cutlass across the nose of its mount. It would have been a good tactic against a horse. The slash of pain across the muzzle would have been enough to send it rearing in panic probably throwing its rider down in the process. But against a boar, the maneuver proved almost fatal. Far from frightening it, the pain just inflamed its temper. With an almost human roar of anger, the animal lunged forward, the rider thrown off its back by the unexpected movement. Chervez leapt away from the first bite and scrambled back onto the wagon, losing the heel of his boot to the boar's snapping teeth. The fallen orc, meanwhile, had scrambled back to his feet, Leaving its mount to distract the Strigony, it ducked under the wagon and popped up to attack the Strigony from the rear. Krom saw the cleaver raised to strike and threw his spear in a perfect, thoughtless reaction. The weapon hissed gleefully in the air. There was a meaty thump and a barbed tip punched into the orc's back and into the planking of the wagon. 
It scrabbled around as helplessly as a cockroach on a pin, howling in sudden terror as the ogre rushed forwards, drawing the belt knife. Shervez felt the wagon shaking beneath him and looked to see what was happening, and saw Krom's looming shape. The boar did the same, but it was a second too late. Its teeth snapped on empty air as the ogre seized the wiry scruff of its neck and stabbed down between the two first vertebrae of its spine. Thank you, the pale-faced Strigony shouted above the noise of battle. Krom, with his own misshapen features now freckled with sprayed blood, dazzled him with a grin full of quartz. Shervez was glad to see it. As gruesome as it was, he couldn't think of another face he would rather see. Then their smiles faded, as, just as another wagon fell crashing onto its side, the forest burst asunder with a new tide of attackers. The riders had followed the Domnus instruction to the letter. Drifting away into the morning mist, they had slung to the copse of trees he'd selected. Beneath their dripping bows, the horsemen had waited, shivering, until the breaking dawn showed them the path northwards. It was a rough path, hardly more than a goat track through the woods and meadows that blanketed the hills. In the chill of the morning, the dew had shone like the ice on the spider's webs that crisscrossed it, and the temptation to gallop through them had been all but irresistible. They had soon left the caravan behind. The day grew warmer as they charged along, racing north until the morning was full and the dewdrops had long since vanished. Then they had wheeled and turned to the east, squinting as their mounts had splashed through a river valley which seemed to lead straight into the sun. One hour later and they wheeled again, turning behind their leader as neatly as a flock of sparrows as he trotted back into the hills, heading south now to finish their maneuver. There was no more galloping now, no more wild careering through the bracken and gorse or shallow foaming water. On this leg of the journey, there was only caution, stealth, and wide-eyed alertness. Flora, already itching with frustration at being under somebody else's command, began to hate it even more. He knew why things had to be done this way. The Domnu had explained it all very carefully, and it all made sense. Even so, having seen their enemy, this long, torturous route became a sort of torment. The waiting was the problem, the anticipation. It twisted its stomach up into tight knots, and strummed on his nerves even as it greased the palms with sweat. If only they'd been able to charge, either at the enemy or away from them. Flora knew that once the attack began, he would have no more time to fear. There would just be the drunken rush of adrenaline and concentration, the god's own drug that would see him through to either death or victory. When the harsh cry of the enemy trumpet rang out from beyond the next ridge, it was almost a relief. Right then, lads, the strigony who was leading them said. Looks like we got here just in time. Any rewards for the first kill, Kali? Sergei asked, and Flora's ears pricked up. Not really, Kali winked at him. Just the boasting rights. Although they'd barely spoken a word since leaving Grumond, Sergei and Flora exchanged a brief, hard look. Neither of them spoke of any challenge, but neither of them needed to. The nervousness that had been twisting Florent's stomach into painful knots vanished, disappearing as completely as the morning dew. In its place was the decision that, whatever the cost, he would take more heads than any arrogant little strigony. Sergei, who was pointedly looking away, had already come to the same conclusion. Time to move, Collie said, as the first distant sounds of battle floated up from the valley below. Slow trot at first. Nobody to pass me until I give the word. He waited for the men to chorus their agreement before leading off into the slanting afternoon sunlight. Flora and Sergei found themselves jostling for position just behind them. Let me go first, Flora told his rival. I need room to fire. So saying, he drew the pistol, flourishing it like a card player with an ace. The strigony was unimpressed. No, I'll go first, he said. There'll be no bell to save you this time, remember. Better let the real fighters do their jobs. Despite the angry flush that colored his cheeks, Flora kept his tone light. Yes, you're a good fighter on a stage, but this is war, not entertainment. You should stay out of the way and let me show you how it's done. I've seen your way, 
Sergei said, adjusting his seat as the column speeded up. Falling down and bleeding. Not much good against orcs. As the Bretonian struggled to think of a suitable reply, Oak gave way to Beach, and the forest began to thin. A loud, piercing scream cut into the dappled light, and Collie, taking it as a signal, broke into a canter. Watch and learn, my boy, was the best Flora could come up with, as the column became a line, and the line accelerated to full gallop. Eighty hooves beat a rumor of their coming on the rich loam of the forest floor, sending leaves flying up like confetti and filling the air with the smell of soil. Flora felt his heart swell, felt the blood singing in his veins and the breath of the quickening wind fresh on the skin. For a moment, his smile grew wide and white in the shade of the forest, and then the horsemen were clear, the thunder of their charge hurling them into the brightness of the meadow beyond. The grass swished across their horses' fetlocks, whispering the same sibilant promise as the wind that hissed in their manes. Charge! Collie yelled with wild abandon, and with barely a pause, the riders fell upon the rear of the unsuspecting orcs. The evening air was heavy and still. Smoke from the cooking fires drifted upwards in tall, unbroken columns, only feathering away when it passed across the first of the stars. The men that sat around these campfires were also still, also heavy. At least, some of them were. Others were too alive to rest for even a moment. They laughed and drank, and bounded from one fire to the other. They boasted and they sang, stopping only to refill their pipes or their bellies. Despite their years, their excitement made them seem like newborn lambs, still drunk with the miracle of their own birth. Even the agonized cries that sometimes rang out of the circled wagons seemed to have little effect on their high spirits. If anything, they merely served to fuel them. Sergei, his back to the safety of the loggered caravan, seemed to share a little of every man's mood. While his face was grim, his brows lowered in an expression as black as the approaching night. His movements were quick and restless. Somehow he didn't seem able to stop pacing around a corpse that lay tumbled in the grass. A few hours earlier, it had been an orc. No, not an orc, Sergei thought bitterly. My orc. It had been after the shock of their charge had sent the greenskins fleeing in confusion that Sergei met this particular specimen. He'd already killed two others, cutting them down like cattle as they milled about between the hammer of the cavalry and the anvil of the caravan. Unfortunately, so had that smug milksop of a Bretonian. That was why he'd been thankful to find this orc. It had been a lively specimen, full of fight despite an arrow in his leg. It had been big, too. So big that its death would have brought Sergei the victory over Florent, which time had so unfairly denied him in the boxing ring. But just as he'd drawn the cutlass back in preparation for a single killing blow, the orc's head had exploded. A great gout of black blood and splintered bone had splattered back as it collapsed undoubtedly dead before it even hit the ground. When Sergei looked around, there was Flora, grinning like an overpaid whore over the smoking muzzle of his cursed pistol. That damned Flora, Sergei thought, and kicked the orc hard enough to make its corpse jump. What kind of stupid name was that? Weren't thinking of your old man, were you? A voice said from behind him. It was sudden and close enough to make Sergei jump. No, Pa, not you. The two strigony lapsed into silence and looked down at the carcass. They were so intent that it might have just sat up and started telling them their fortune. You fought well today, lad, Domno Sherves told his son after a moment. To kill a pair of orcs is something to remember and savor. Sergei's forehead creased and looked at the Domnu as he tried to find the right words. Just ask our friend, D'Artan, the Domnu continued before he could do so. He knows it. He only killed one more than you, and now he's sitting around the fire telling us all about it. But he shot the third, Sergei said, voice deceptively calm. And it was mine. He shot it right from under my nose. Yes, his father nodded. It was a good shot, wasn't it? Looks like he got it right between the eyes. And from horseback, too. Quite impressive. 
quite lucky, Sergei grumbled, and Adomno's eyes hardened. He killed three, you killed two. Can you change that? No, I cannot. So, what are you going to do? Sergei scowled down at the orc, as though it might know the answer. For a second, the vicious yellow slash of its remaining eye twinkled in the light of the rising moon. It might have almost been winking. Accept it, Sergei said, with a sigh of resignation. Get him next time. Domno Sherves slapped his son on the shoulder. Good lad. Now, like I said, the Bretonian is sitting at the fireside now, telling everyone how he bested you. What are you going to do about that? I'm going to go, Sergei decided, and shake him by the hand, offer my congratulations. The Domnu nodded approvingly. Good idea. I'll come with you. I want to hear him tell the story again. Why are you looking at me like that? I do. He's only told the damn thing a dozen times. I want to hear it again. Sergei was still reluctantly smiling as he strode back into the camp. Once there, he surprised everyone, most of all Flora himself, by shaking the Bretonian by the hand. Well done, he said. Good shooting. I was just lucky, Flora said, bemused. I know, Sergei replied. But never mind, I'll get you next time. We'll see, Flora allowed. We'll see. The next day, the caravan left the last of the hills behind it and wound its way up into the mountains proper.